Using a 20-sided die to resolve tasks in D&D I think is a little bit of brilliance. The D20 is the unsung hero of the system. I've played in percentile systems and liked them and would probably play in them again. Games like Middle Earth Roleplaying and Role Master and Space Master, which I, those are all the same system, by the way. And one of the things I remember liking about those games is that your character got better at things by doing them, which was a neat little innovation that I think people would still like. So percentile systems are alluring because they seem so straightforward. It's so easy to hold in our head the idea that we have a 20% chance of casting the spell. But the problem is, we don't live our lives in terms of percentages. In actual play, the difference between having an 80% chance of hitting and an 81% chance of hitting or a 79% chance of hitting is not perceivable over the course of an evening's play. That's the brilliance of the D20 is that by taking what is essentially a percentile system and breaking it up into 5% chunks, we now are playing with the, I think, basically human perceivable levels of difference. We, over the course of one evening's play, probably will detect the difference between needing a 14 to hit and a 15 to hit. It may only happen once, but when it does happen and you go, oh, if I only had plus one, you remember it. So far, this probably seems like a running the game video, but it's not really. It's actually just the recap. Hey, everybody, Matt Covill here. It's just the recap of our Saturday morning world building stream. Every Saturday morning at 11 o'clock Pacific, we get together and we flesh out the city of Capital, the greatest city in this or any age, which is the setting of my upcoming D&D stream. It's worth noting the characters don't begin the campaign in Capital. In fact, the first couple of sessions are about them trying to get to Capital. The stream went well on Saturday. We streamed for like four hours, and I thought the signal to noise ratio was actually pretty good. But one of the things that we like about streaming on Twitch is the direct interaction with chat, and that often leads us down into interesting tangents that have nothing to do with D&D or world building, which I actually think make for quite a poor YouTube video. So typically, traditionally, after a Saturday morning world building stream, I spend and what is, if, it, if a stream is two hours long, it might take me six or eight hours to edit it down to something watchable on YouTube. And after streaming for four hours on Saturday, I didn't have it in me. I thought this is gonna take me four days of editing to pare down to just the good bits. So instead, I figured we would talk about it here, now, and that's this. We had really what I thought of as one major breakthrough in the stream that was worth talking about and is relevant to us as dungeon masters and game designers. So last Saturday, we got through the first half of the monster manual, just going through it monster by monster to figure out, are there any of these in Capital? Capital is supposed to be a very kind of multicultural city, and I thought that was going to be a lot of fun, and it was, and I'm looking forward to doing the second half this Saturday. The problem was, and I didn't realize this was a problem at first, I was just going through, making an Excel sheet, listing each type of creature, and talking about how many of there are these in Capital, and what I was using, because I hadn't really thought about it, was just percentages, like how many humans are there? And I had some idea of the fact that humans are a plurality, not a majority, so there's more humans than anything else, but not more than 50% humans. That's probably the seed of the road we went down, was me thinking to myself, well, I know there's not more than 50% humans in capital, so what percentage is there? And I would fill in a number, and then as we went, that sort of set the tone for everything. As we went down the list, I would say, okay, if dwarves are the second most populous race in capital, then how many dwarves are there? Well, let's say that there's this percentage. That turned out to be, I think, a spectacularly unprofitable approach to doing it. And it gets us to the lesson of the 20-sided die because the difference between, let's say, there's 4% of this one species in capital and there's 5% of this other species, well, that's a meaningful difference in terms of percentages. But is the player going to notice that? Is the player going to notice the difference between having a 68% chance of hitting and a 69% chance of hitting? That's when we had the breakthrough. I started to think in terms of how I would implement this if I were still a video game designer. Computers are are very powerful and it's very easy to trick ourselves into thinking that if we're listing everything out in terms of precise percentages and we're making sure that that column of percentages adds up to 100%, that we are then doing things in a computer-like way. We're doing things mathematically accurate and it feels good to us as designers to see this column fill up with numbers and to do the math and be sure that we know that there's a 2.1% chance of any given person in the city being a goblin, for instance. That feels authoritative and useful, but that's not how we would do it at the game companies that I worked at. Because not only is the difference between 2.1% and 2.7% not useful to a player who wants to know what do I see when I look around the city, it's not useful to us as designers because we are also people as it turns out. 
contrary to popular belief. A better design would be one that allowed anyone to open up the demography of capital document and be able to tell what are the odds of any given person in the city being a human as opposed to a dwarf. A good system would use human language that anybody can understand to describe the demography of capital and then offload the work of figuring out what does that actually mean to the computer. That process of getting kind of fed up with percentages, realizing it was a distraction, led me to think, literally stop and think about how would I do this if I were still a designer at Pandemic studios back on mercenaries. I would do it with categories, for instance. Instead of saying there's 40% humans in the city, I would say humans are one of the dominant species in the city. And then I would define what dominant means. Dominant means that they can be found anywhere in the city. In any district, you'll be able to find human beings and they are meaningfully involved in the politics of the city. And you can already see how this is better than saying there's 40% humans in the city because a player getting off a boat and looking at the docks of capital will see that there's all sorts of different people, different kinds of people, different creatures here in the city, but it's mostly human. The next most populous category in the city, and we can imagine that each category has fewer, this is the rule, each category has fewer people in it than the category above it, is minority. Minorities can still be found, like the dominant species, anywhere in the city in any district. They just don't have as much political power as the dominant species, and that can be for a number of reasons. These terms are arbitrary, by the way, as are the definitions. They're just useful to us as designers. Then we have an enclave. An enclave is a group of a given species that can only be found in one district of the city. It could be one neighborhood. For instance, tieflings have an enclave in capital. They are refugees from Alloy, which is my version of the city of Brass, and they came here a few years ago after the city of Brass fell in a war. And there are lots of analogies historically and present day in the real world to refugees from a war who end up with their own little place in the city, and in that place in the city, all of the signs and everything are all in whatever language, infernal, whatever language tieflings speak. Tieflings aren't the only enclave in capital, by the way. There could be lots of enclaves. Then we have groups. Groups are smaller than an enclave. There could be literally 12 of them. For instance, there is a delegation of Azer, also from Alloy, the folks who won the war that the tieflings lost. And there's only like 12 of them, but they are together. They all know each other. Then we have individuals, which means these folks can be found in capital, but they're each there for their own reasons. And they don't represent any kind of larger demographic population in the city. You can imagine like Dragonborn. There are Dragonborn in the city, but there isn't a Dragonborn neighborhood or a Dragonborn, you know, embassy or anything like that. Then we have singular, which means there is literally only one of these. Like, for instance, isn't there a beholder crime boss in Waterdeep? That would be singular. And I thought early on, we decided that there was a singular Aboleth somewhere in the city, probably in the layers. This is one of the reasons to tune into these streams on Saturday morning, by the way, because the idea of the layers, I, I knew, for instance, that there was capital and then there was this major undercity below it that was run by the dwarves. And this city would be where you would put all of the creatures that have sunlight sensitivity and stuff like that. So they are still part of the city as a whole, but they tend to keep to the undercity. They can be found in capital. They trade with the businesses in capital. They go upstairs to buy things. But this city below the city is its own cultural entity run by the dwarves. I described capital as being built on the ruins of other larger cities. And that's where this undercity sort of comes from. And someone in chat said that they thought it'd be neat if the undercity were just called the layers. And I was like, that is a good idea. That's the nice thing about chat is we sort of get the best of my ideas and the uh, wisdom of crowds. I think this list of dominant minority, enclave, group, individuals, singular, is incredibly useful, much more useful than the percentages we were going with. And it would now be very easy to go through and translate this into what are the odds of any given person I meet in the city being from any of these different groups, depending on where in the city I am. But it should also be obvious that these labels are arbitrary and these definitions are arbitrary. We just made them up in the moment. And if we were doing it again from scratch, I would probably come up with different labels and different definitions. I never want people to think my way is the only way. I want people to know this is just stuff we made up and it was useful in the moment and it was obvious even to chat while we were watching. People were like, this is way better. And your version of these labels could be entirely different. What these labels are and what their definitions are are not, I don't think, that meaningful. What's meaningful is using categories as opposed to percentages. I think percentages are just distracting, they look official, and they're not actually useful at the end of the day. We got all the way to L, and so we're going to start with M, and we'll find out if there are mind flayers, for instance, in capital. Spoilers, there are. I don't know why, I just think that'd be cool. 
That'll be 11 o'clock Pacific time, Saturday morning. I'll put a link to the Twitch channel in the doobly-doo. We get about 1,100 people that show up for these world building streams. They're a lot of fun. Chat is super cool. It never gets unruly. And we sometimes have sneak peeks, uh, spoilers of stuff that's coming for the campaign. Tonight, now that break is over, we're back to Tuesday nights being last game wins, which means, by the way, I just put Jerry on the hook for getting this video edited today. One of the benefits of following us on Twitch is that you get notified when I go live for NetHack, which is a game that I thought folks on Twitch would enjoy watching, and I think I was right. NetHack is sort of a perfect Twitch thing because we can play it. It's weird. It's D&D, but it's turn-based, so we can stop, and I can talk to chat, and we can have interesting digressions, and we are having a crazy NetHack run. The character that we created, I think now at this point months ago, is high level and on her way to possibly ascending. And we've had all sorts of crazy, I just got my brain eaten by a mind flare. And as a result, I forgot a ton of scrolls and potions, what they do and how they work. I even forgot the map of the dungeon so that some levels we go to and I've been quasi mind wiped, some things we still remember. So that's one of the cool things about following us on Twitch is that you get alerts when I go play NetHack and it'll tell you on your phone, it'll say, hey, Matt is live playing NetHack. And you can be like, well, I don't care about NetHack. Or you can tune in and watch. It's a lot of fun. Having said that, of course, now the next time we play, and I don't know when that is, we don't really have a schedule for it. We're probably going to die. NetHack is death. It comes quickly and often in this game. And we're incredibly lucky this run. I think, I don't know, there must have been like 15 different Tarnas before this one, none of whom made it past about level seven. And now we're on almost level 30. So of course that means I just whammied myself. This video along with this office and last game wins and the upcoming D&D stream are all sponsored by Strongholds and Followers, our fifth edition supplement that lets you do things like build towers or keeps and recruit followers and even raise armies and fight wars. It has been incredibly well received by the D&D community for which I am hugely grateful and we are going to continue updating it and revising it based on feedback and some of that feedback people have said hey it would be neat to have like design diaries where I pick a section of the book, a rule set like retainers for instance and talk about how we did it and what our thinking was and how we intended to be used. And I thought that was a good idea. So we will probably do a video like that maybe even this week. If you like these videos, if you want to support the channel, the best way to do it is by strongholds and followers. I promise you three things. It will be fun to read. It will be pretty and have a lot of great art in it. And I guarantee you, if you play fifth edition, there is something in here that you will want to steal and use. It's 20 bucks for the PDF, which you can download immediately. 30 bucks, you can pre-order the hardcover and we throw in the PDF for free. And the hardcover is going to ship sometime like in about three months, we think. Next video, I think we're going to talk about your character. Until then, peace out.